let's talk about some nutrition stuff we were planning <laughs> on talking about, shall we? <laughs> so this this podcast episode, which <laughs> started in a fun way, I am definitely leaving that in. Um, mm. We want to talk about uh, the fact that nutritional discourse is fractured. Mm. There you go. That's that's now you can tell I'm reading that off a piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> go on, you explain a bit better. Why what yeah, do we want so this episode what, to be about? What we wanted to to address is why the discourse around nutrition is so difficult. Because when we introduced the podcast in the first episode, we talked about some of the problems with the food as medicine rhetoric. Mm-hmm. We talked about some of the whys and wherefores of of what makes it problematic and mm. why we don't agree with it as as a mantra but what we didn't really delve into a bit further other than highlighting that things like the source hierarchy of of who we listen to in nutrition is quite skewered um is really helping people identify some of the actual underlying issues in terms of bias and in terms of fallacies and in terms of the i guess lack of critical thinking that Hmm. goes into not just the lay public consuming information about nutrition but also frighteningly because we both have access to some of these conversations involving healthcare professionals real absence of of critical thinking and and i've i've referred to this recently and and taken some some stick for it um as critical illiteracy amongst mm, healthcare mm. professionals and it's a play on the O'Mahony book um can medicine be cured where he has a point about he says that doctors are statistically illiterate um yeah and i've kind of spun that because it, you know in it's it's not just any you know one profession it's it's i think people generally but particularly also healthcare professionals are critically illiterate and that's because when you do a course now you know your goal is to get through the course and get your mark and most courses the lecturers show up they give you the references they present the lecture and you base your course work that you do and your assignments around those references and you're mm-hmm. you're not you're you're getting the information and often because of time pressures really just repackaging and regurgitating that information yeah. back some courses will do a little bit of of critical thinking work but you know maybe it's a couple of modules in first year or something like that bottom line is we don't have a lot of practitioners who are very good at critically thinking about research mm. um and we're going to go into this specifics in relation to healthcare professionals more in in subsequent episodes where we focus specifically on different pathologies and how they relate to nutrition and diet diet disease relationships but for now i think we want to keep this a broader um analysis really of what barriers to better thinking do we face in nutrition right now yeah and and how are they manifest online how are they manifest in healthcare professionals how can people in the lay public be a better critical thinker about the information they're receiving and maybe identify some of the biases and fallacies that are being put across and of course central to be able to do that in the first place to be able to identify that something may be biased or or be fallacious in its thinking is you have to be able to let go of your own in the first place. <laughs> um, you know, and it's it's the identity problem in nutrition that that probably is the first barrier that people have to get over. So um, we're going to try and put the world to rights in this podcast? No, we're just going to try <laughs> and give people a few basic common issues that seem to come across yeah. in nutrition. Common no, biases, I, common fallacies. Yeah, yeah. But really where it starts is the identity issue. And I know that's something you've touched on a bit in in some of your kind mm. of writing and commentary recently mm. well i mean the reason i was I made that slightly facetious <laughs> comment was mainly just because this stuff can feel really complicated yeah like this can this can feel like the hardest part of all of these conversations is just how the hell are we meant to be describing this stuff to people people right. especially from a from a healthcare professional perspective people come in with all of these preconceptions that they've been told and they now believe right and you know are if we're going to do some good when it comes to 
explaining a little bit about nutrition. And yeah, in the end, it can come down to a bit of debate. I mean, it's not very hard when people don't know anything already. You can kind of tell them things and they'll be like, oh, okay, cool, that's great. But it's when people come in and they've been going low carb for the last year and they've seen results from it or whatever right and they feel better and so if you there's no that it can feel like you're hitting a brick wall when it comes to having conversations and i agree yeah that comes and, down and, to that and actually stuff. a big a big and interesting kind of add-on to that in terms of the feedback that i get from a lot of the nutrition and medical professionals that i speak to that are in practice mm. is that someone may have adopted a certain diet at the outset and got some results, but actually now they're engaging in a sunk cost fallacy because their health is now suffering because yeah. they have just doubled down on this approach that they believe in because it got them a certain result. Mm. And maybe they lost weight or maybe they, I don't know, improved some subjective marker yeah, of how they feel. It doesn't matter. A symptom or felt whatever. better. So they became attached to whatever that diet was, yeah. that paradigm was. They probably started to only read sources emanating from that particular paradigm, confirming their own biases and their and and their own thinking. But perhaps two years down the line, th this is no longer serving them and they can't move away from it mm. because they're so in deep at the level of emotion, at the level of identity. It's a part of their self-construct yeah. and they can't let go of it. And I, I've spoken to, I've had some really interesting conversations recently with practitioners where like, that's their barrier. They have to now try and make someone see that this, this approach to their health uh, is, is not serving them. Mm. And, and that's a massive barrier for healthcare professionals. 10, 15 years ago, you know, there wasn't this issue that, that healthcare professionals faced where they're in the field, but someone's coming in and they know more. And I say that in inverted commas, right? Yeah, yeah. They know more. But sometimes than, that's true as well. That's that's the problem. I mean, it's 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 rare. Point being, <laughs> they come in armed with Doctor Google. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They come in armed armed with with studies Mark that you Hyman. haven't heard of. They and, come in, yeah. yeah, right. And you know, well, I I know that this will work because I follow this person, and they're a they're a functional medicine doctor. <laughs> it's like Jason oh. Fung told me yeah, that yeah. this is actually I we should, should all intermittently fast. That's it. Yeah, and it will cure everything. Right. <laughs> and so this is the barrier now because people are coming in they're, they're, it, The irony of it is they're going to see someone that is, you know, an, an, like a, a, a trained in this area. Yeah. You know, they go in and meet their dietitian and they sit down and they're just like, well, uh, I know that, you know, insulin is <laughs> is the reason that I have these health problems. <laughs> Maybe not. And so it's not even that you're going to a professional to get professional advice. People are going to a professional to give their own perspective <laughs> and to tell them what they think. But I think in one way, so that brings up an, easy, an interesting question as to uh, how has this identity uh, stuff in nutrition ended up working its way into the professional side as well? So has it, so has, because that, that brings up a question to me as yeah. to you've got people who have this part of their diet as right. their identity now where they see themselves as a low carb human or right. whatever. Yes. It sounds stupid saying it, it like that, but that's really essentially does. what it is. Yeah. Um, and who is going to be the best dietitian or nutritionist or doctor for them in their mind? Mm -hmm. It's going to be a low carb GP right. or it's going exactly. to be a low carb nutritionist or a low carb dietitian. And so... I'd, has has the 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 kind of age of uh, professionals having an identity like that been born out of an uh, of like that's going to sell or has it kind of come the other way around? It's I difficult... think it's definitely born out of this. It's difficult to tease out the cause and effect. Yeah, yeah. One one thing is it's definitely no, but here. I need an answer. Alan. I know. <laughs> it's definitely here. We know that because we see people billing themselves as like the low carb, a low carb doctor or a low carb dietitian, a keto doctor. I. Ha, any talk that I've ever given to healthcare professionals, I've always said that it's incumbent on us to be nutritionally agnostic. Mm. Uh, I firmly, firmly stand by that. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, there's good reasons Professor for that. John Unitas at Stanford, who his opinions on nutrition science, I, I fundamentally disagree with on so many levels. Um, he's a biomedical purist that basically thinks nutrition science doesn't give any reliable answers. And it's like, well, it depends on what research question you're asking, of course. Anyway. Um, 
one point that he does make that I do agree with wholeheartedly is that people publishing research in nutrition should should have to state what their what their personal beliefs about yeah. diet are. And yeah, I really yeah. agree with that. And you look at you know people like David Ludwig or Cara Ebeling who you know who published that series of studies like showing the purportedly showing the greater energy expenditure on low carb diets but yeah. basically tailored their protocol so that using a doubly labeled water method would show that and it's like that's not integrity in research and so and there's there's a group in in the Czech Republic who publish on like vegan diets and you know and and, and cardiometabolic outcomes you know, but the, the comparison diets that they put together are terrible because they're never matched for things like fiber or saturated fat. And it's like, you're, of course you're going to find a better, you know. So I, I really think that people should have to, where they have those dietary beliefs, should have to disclose them in the way that you have to disclose where you get your funding from. Um, and <laughs> and that's, you know, it's, look, there's, you know, that's, that's not an easy solution. But no. point, point being... This plays out in research. Um, it plays out in yeah. Do you think that this, life? this identity kind of science has has made the the body of research worse? Yeah, uh, I think it definitely has, and I think it's the identity politics of science means that people then, you know, take. Um, a certain stance on on research, mm. try and obviously back it up by reference to evidence. Um, but just because it's evidence doesn't mean it's any good. Yeah. And probably the most, the most uh, I think, topical current example of that in the UK would be Asim al Hatra and the kind of the low carb movement yeah. within medicine who just have this totally distorted perspective on the evidence, continue to cite studies that we know are highly flawed mm. uh, and they just don't care because it's not about the integrity of what the research says for them. It's about establishing their worldview as the dominant worldview through which public health in the UK is seen. And that's really, really dangerous. Mm. So the identity stuff is an issue. I think, I think the current access to be a celebrity healthcare professional is a is a big part of this problem because you can't you're not going to get a three book deal by being the doctor who says take your statins kids evidence supports it right? no, but, but I'm planning <laughs> on being don't don't <laughs> dash right. my hopes and my dreams you like know, that you, you're the doctor who says oh you've high blood pressure you know we can we, let's do diet and lifestyle but if that doesn't work you're going on an ACE inhibitor you know like that's yeah. you you can't just you can't get that kind of level of commercial opportunity by just doing your job in any profession. It's not right? exciting. It's not exciting. <laughs> Food is sexy. Nutrition sexy. It's it's still a field emerging. So there's you know there's still a lot of research coming out. There's still a lot of new nuance to it. Mm. And this is how you can be something beyond that. And I think the commercialization of this and the identity. Uh, politics of it really started with the functional medicine crowd in America, and you know they you could see that that the commercialization of that movement ten years ago, mm. when ironically all these kind of functional quote unquote docs were also like keto low carb we're wrong about sat fat sugar's the issue processed foods eat real foods we're paleolithic beings blah 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 and the next minute they're all in and and what i find really funny about this appeal to nature narrative fallacy about our ancient past is these are all the fuckers that are off in hyperbaric oxygen chambers and you know and and, get, and getting their blood typing and listening to Dave Asprey and getting some electrodes through that their head you know to, yeah, to, to, well, to optimize just... their health and they're in infrared saunas and it's just like it's paleo as fuck dude yeah keep doing you know it's all such classist nonsense as it well is which is nonsense. which is perhaps and this is that that will be our next podcast but it's it is though and it's just of course it is it's not it's not the people that need to have any of this advice no. it's completely pointless no. and even even if the advice was even true right, right. so right. even if you know flipping infrared saunas 
actually had a really good beneficial effect on your body. Mm -hmm. Who the hell can afford an infrared sauna right. in their home? Right. Who can afford what to go it? to... I don't even know what it is. Uh, it's just, I mean... I mean, I've been in a sauna before, but like, where does the infrared come in? I, d I don't know. Okay. I did look it up at one point to see if there was any truth in right. it, and it was all just nonsense. But it was intravenous glutathione. <laughs> that's that's what people in the, that's what people in socially deprived areas need. Exactly. No, no, you they know? need B twelve injections. Right. Because yeah. they don't eat enough leafy greens. <laughs> yeah. I just uh, you made that up. Yeah, I did. There's no, leafy, <laughs> there's, there's, there's no B twelve in leafy greens. Shut up. I'm um, cutting that bit. No, no, I, no. But, but yeah, I, no, no, I know what yeah, you mean. But it's yeah, yeah. it's but that but that's the thing, right? It's just whatever logic makes sense at the time. It's right. just you know, oh well, I need B twelve because I don't have enough energy, and mm. so therefore, if I have this, it's going to cure everything, and that's going to be the the result of you know. It's just oh, just yeah. I can't stand it. But I think I think. Yeah, I think the identity stuff has always probably been there with nutrition because it is, we eat every day, it's it's part of our self-construct. I think commercial opportunity in the healthcare space has rapidly advanced the dogma to which people engage with their particular beliefs, whatever oh, yeah. their paradigm is. And then I think there's... Well, people like to feel part of a community. Right. So it's if it's the their identity, thing. then it's going to sell. So there's a reason why these books are selling now and they didn't right. 30 years ago. Well, right. actually, I don't know. Atkins was how many years ago? Now? Yeah. <laughs> it's been but, going on a while, and, but and it's like, definitely It has more been now. going on a while, you know, and, and you go back to the 80s and that obsession with, you know, with, with diet was, was there as well. Yeah. There was an enormous dieting industry in, in the 80s and books and supplements and all that stuff. So th this isn't new. What's new is that the people that are, are not... There's an amazing article that Ben Goldacre wrote... Hmm. Um, back in i guess 2007 and he basically talked about the role of doctors in uh, addressing misinformation and it was really really good because he talked how, how doctors can get behind the headlines right okay and he has this quote in it where he says um he talks about you know someone coming in with being misinformed about something they found in the Daily Mail. And he said, but beyond mere firefighting, this service has a more important role. As doctors or nurses or anyone working in health, we don't provide information just for our patients. We are all situated in communities and our lives outside of work, we are in a unique position to communicate. When people have been scared or misled about MMR or chemotherapy or anything, they will look to us and a leaflet, a poster or a website is of little help. Everybody misconstrues things in ways that are unique to them and people can be disabused only on a one-to-one -one level. With real evidence, we are all better placed to communicate the truth behind the news. That hit me so hard when I found it because we fast forward 10 years. One, we're dismissing real evidence. Mm. It's impossible now to get to the truth behind the news because you have things like the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine that organize flat earth conferences. Yeah. And get get an engineer to talk about diet heart hypothesis, and and get people literally to come in and tell a generation of eager young medics that they should take their patients off statins. And this is not not someone with any real people of bad yeah. information. This is disempowering people and undermining a body of evidence that we have. And so, I find his article really prescient because, it, it, if anything, the absolute reverse has happened. And medical professionals and healthcare professionals and even nutrition professionals are not capable of helping people get behind the headlines about diet, whether that headline's in a paper or some blogger on Instagram. They can't get behind the evidence because they've, one, they're clouded by their own identity and their mm -hmm. own beliefs mm -hmm. about diet. And two, they don't have the critical appraisal skills to actually take the paper apart. So we're in a really, really difficult spot right now. And but I then think is, is that the problem? Because so if we did have the critical appraisal skills to take that paper apart like as i know Would i the identity do. still it yeah. still get in the way it doesn't make any yeah, difference it with, doesn't with, exactly. with the patients that are coming in to talk about this right, stuff right. because you can you can present the you know i i have the critical appraisal i think some of the critical appraisal skills but you have to do research and publish to as part of <laughs> as part your of being career a surgeon, of being yeah. a surgeon but but even so, when I have someone come or when I have someone ask me about something, even doctors asking about stuff, 
when I present them with the, 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 the kind of studies to go and look at or the, the evidence to the contrary, they go, ah, oh, no, but those, those studies are rubbish. Yeah. And it's so they're, they're there's an outright dismissal. Exactly, yeah. because their identity is already there. Exactly. It's already made. So, so, the, so actually what how, Goldacre hadn't you know, considered, <laughs> because it wasn't an issue back yeah. then, obviously, was the identity issues that are now coming up Within professionals themselves. Within professionals yeah. themselves. And and again, you know, this identity stuff, I think it is unique to nutrition in a, in a weird way because, you know, no one sits back at the end of their day and is just like, I am an antihypertensive doctor. Like, <laughs> what? You know, I'm, I'm the statin doc. Like, no, no, no. They're a <laughs> lifestyle medic. And, and as, as such... <laughs> Their entire goal is to take people's medication away. And right. the problem is, or the problem I see, is that that's not necessarily inherently a bad goal if it's backed with good evidence. If you can reduce the amount of medication that a patient is on, that's great. Of course. But not, not for the sake of it. No. It's let's find something that justifies my actions rather than right. let's see whether my actions it's, are justified it's not, in the first place. Exactly. And it's not thinking through to is, is this person able to come off medication with these interventions like there is a total distortion of the end goal whereby it's just this flippant end goal of let's get everybody off meds mm. and it's like okay but are you actually thinking about the process by which that happens yeah. and whether it's even appropriate in the first place relative to how often diet has a ceiling level of impact that it can have yeah and so yeah, I think I think the identity and of course the whole concept of being a lifestyle medic that is an identity. Yeah. That no, is I an agree. absolute identity. It it shouldn't even be a title. It I mean, really I know shouldn't. I know it's become a title because of the fact that people have doctors typically have ignored lifestyle. Yeah. But lifestyle should be just part of medicine. It but shouldn't be a it, it shouldn't be an identity in it itself. It shouldn't be an identity in itself. Every doctor should be recognizing the impact that exercise and sleep and diet can have on our well-being at the same time as knowing all of the human physiology yeah, that I, allows I, us to prescribe medication, right. allows us to treat disease. All that kind yeah. of stuff is just being a doctor. Right. Why exactly. do we have to have a label on it? Yeah. Once we create a label, it becomes something that we then have to justify. We 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 spend all all the time justifying justifying our identity if it's an identity issue it means that it creates an argument mm -hmm. if i'm just a doctor there's no argument there but if i'm a lifestyle doctor mm. then automatically it means that you if you're not one you're not doing something right yes and so your whole then every moment spent outside of seeing actual patients or maybe every moment seeing patients as well is justifying why being a lifestyle doctor or a lifestyle medic is the way that we should all be doing it. Yes. And absolutely. it's, and, and that I think in itself encourages woo. The, it, yeah. It encourages does. the, it encourages the deliberate ignorance of right. stuff that disagrees, that, that, that makes your message harder. Exactly. And it's having a whole idea yeah. of being the maverick, right? You know, mm. it's like, we're the revolution within medicine. We're the, we're the, the, the vanguard, the spearhead of this movement that's going to radicalize and change the way we approach health. And it's like, well, actually, medicine is constantly in a process of evolving. So is dietetics, so is nutrition, so is aviation, right? Mm. It's, you go back to, um, and I, I really, I always enjoy my, talking to my dad about this because he was a flight safety investigator as, as well as a pilot. And he's given talks to the medical profession about mm. how they can apply human yeah, yeah, factors yeah, yeah. management lessons from aviation. Yeah, well, I mean, the it's whole really Swiss cheese model of, of mistakes and everything right. was all from the aviation. Yeah, it's all it's, from aviation. Again, but the resistance something... to implementing even hand sanitizers in hospitals was enormous at the time because there is a there is a hierarchy there and there is a resistance to change but there was still an evolution and and EBM allowed that evolution to happen along making better decisions based on information so yeah. things like thalidomide babies didn't happen right yeah. but it's constantly evolving and I, I wholeheartedly agree with that point you were saying that like now that now that this information is to hand about the role that lifestyle does play in chronic long-term conditions. Mm. Of course, the next no step one's is denying, just, by the way, right? no one's not. Well, no we're one's not. Like, so it's, but the next step isn't like, you know, this like spin-off group. It's just now we incorporate this into everyday practice yeah. and we build it on the evidence. What you don't need is a fringe group that then needs to feel vindicated in, in being maverick and, and yeah. changing the game. 
And so in order to do that, it's not inviting nutrition professionals to present about nutrition or to give the evidence for, you know, heart disease or diabetes. It's just inviting some flat earther from within its own ranks to talk about it. So the question, why is that happening now and not? So, for example, when when penicillin was discovered, Mm -hmm. right, it was amazing and the general medical you know population took it as this is great it didn't start a spin-off group of people who right. thought yeah we're that, the penicillin thought, doctors exactly <laughs> do you know what i mean though we're the penicillin <laughs> medics like come on it, it's funny but it's the same flipping thing oh, so it didn't good. it didn't create a spin-off of uh. of penicillin medicine where <laughs> penicillin was then able to cure all ailments yeah. and Every other treatment method was now pointless, was now pointless. because penicillin or is wrong, now or yeah, morally wrong. Yeah, because penicillin is now going to cure everything. It didn't create a. So it didn't funny. create a group of scientists who investigated whether penicillin could cure every disease. Right. Because you know what. We know basic human physiology. And even though we didn't know about penicillin, when we found out about it, we still knew about basic human physiology. Mm -hmm. It didn't change everything else. Right. So if you were going to then start using penicillin to like try and, I don't don't even know, I'm trying to think of the most ridiculous thing possible. So, I mean, who like cure long sightedness. Right. If you like, no one was going to test that because it's ridiculous. It's just nonsense. Right. And so, but that's what's going on with lifestyle medicine. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's people are using infrared saunas right. to try and treat something you're going, right. but they're, they're going, oh, yes, but but it might work. Yeah. And we should try and find out because yeah. it gives more validity to our claims. And yeah. that, I think, leads on nicely to one of those, to one of those, those fallacies mm-hmm. that we were talking about in terms of being able to identify some of those fallacies right. of, going, of doing that whole... Um, uh, which one was it? The the appeal to ignorance. The appeal to ignorance. Yeah, where, yeah. where you know, science doesn't know everything yet, which mm-hmm. is true. Mm-hmm. Therefore, maybe penicillin does cure long sightedness. Right. Or maybe a carnivore diet and two ribeyes a day is all you need. And actually, we don't need vegetables. Right. <laughs> so... But this, it's the same thing. Like the think same of thing. think of try and every time this comes up, think of a penicillin medic and think of how ridiculous that That's would be. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's, it's like, oh no, thing. it's not because we know diet's so important. Yeah, so is penicillin. Yeah. Like it's it is, but so it can't aspirin. cure everything. Yeah. And yeah. you know, I was just I think <sighs> I think the the appeal to ignorance fallacy I expect from the, f- the fringes of how populous nutrition is at the minute. Mm. And I would always expect that to be the case. What I have a problem with is where I see, again, healthcare professionals who on paper have an education, just not even understanding basic scientific principles like falsification yeah. and just like throwing any studies that don't accord, particularly within the low carb movement. It's like anything that doesn't that that shows that for example like insulin or genetic predisposition doesn't like influence weight loss in a low carbohydrate versus low fat diet the excellent series of kevin hall metabolic ward studies actually falsifying that specific element of Hmm. the the carbohydrate insulin model ironically weren't they funded by the low carbers in the first place yeah well gary taubes and peter (laughs) atia you couldn't make it up but that's Um, yeah i know but but again i mean if, if if you look at that i mean they, he publicly, Taubes just publicly dismissed not just the studies, but but tried to rubbish the author personally. And I think that's a real example of, 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 of the kind of ignorance and arrogance of that movement, that it's not even just about what's on the, the paper of the literature. And let's talk about that. It's actually just personally attacking people when they don't give you the results that you wanted yeah. to find. And then it's that but that's, whole... That's the, that's the identity politics that's in a the nutshell. the identity politics in a nutshell. You know, you, exactly. see it in, you see it in the stereotypical identity politics of, of kind of actual politics where mm-hmm. it's just, it's not, about, it's not about arguments anymore. It's just about why this person is a bad person. Right. And, and it's just why, why are you as a non-lifestyle medic being, being so you know, inconsiderate to your patients who mm-hmm. would be so much better off if you just paid attention to us yeah it's 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 a personal thing yeah it's just it's not it's not science doesn't care about your feelings no it's not because it doesn't love you it's because (laughs) it doesn't have the ability to yeah Yeah. it's it's meant to be that way it's it's, we're meant to be taking out our our complex identity biases when we are looking at this stuff Mm -hmm. if we don't and we're not and and look at look at the trouble we're in 
Yeah, exactly. Because because although we're focusing on nutrition, this obviously plays out politically. You know, Trump, Brexit, two recent examples yeah. that have been talked to death. It plays out environmentally with climate change. Um, you know, it does play out nutritionally. It, it It's playing out you know, in even things like the flat earth movement. When I talk about flat earthers, by the way, I'm talking about like the LDL, cholesterol, denialism, <laughs> you know, put butter in your coffee, that movement. Take everyone off statins, says a leading cardiologist. I Although use the term leading use, pejoratively. <laughs> um, you, you could use that, that the the, uh, well, yeah. the example for lots of different factions yeah, yeah, of absolutely. nutrition. The but whole low carb movement could be described as the flat earth movement in one way, shape or form. In, in a way, yeah, in the sense that they like continue to just champion these hypotheses that have been tested. You know, I mean, it's like you the, can't just repeat the same stuff over and over and I mean, hope that people will just like. Yeah. I mean, here's a perfect here's a perfect parallel. The flat earth community fund studies to try and prove that they're right. And they prove they're wrong, but they ignore them. And they're the really nice studies. I know. The low really carb, the studies. low carb community yeah. fund studies to try and prove that they're right, and they're really good studies. Yeah. And they show them something they didn't want to believe, and they ignore them. Yeah, it's the same flipping thing. It really, is. like I nice know, analogy. you know, yeah, I know that absolutely. yes, low carb can be helpful for certain people in certain circumstances, and blah 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 yeah. blah. And we will talk yeah, about some of that stuff in later management episodes. Management, potentially. And management, not cure, though. Yeah, Again, though, exactly. that's, yeah, you know, well, that's we, it. And they talk about cure and they talk about remission. It's like, and, no. And yes, I know it's control. not, maybe it's not fair because there is no benefit to believing the earth is flat. But still, like, it, there's, there's, there are parallels there. There are parallels, yeah. And I think we, we really need to be having a very hard look at ourselves as as health as public facing healthcare professionals we have a higher standard and duty of care to not be engaging in this kind of thinking but it's pervasive mm. and it is potentially going to result in something you know it's it's already started in a way there was that person who um marketed themselves as a as a doctor but had the cancer ranch in florida like people mm. died uh, he's going to prison, from what I understand, with a hefty fine. But people have died. Like, you know, do we need someone to... But he's going as a martyr to some people. Right. You know, and that's the thing. Like, you look at it over here. It's like, do we need someone to forego chemo because they think they can eat to beat disease and they die? Is that how... Is that where it's got to go before we start paying attention to this problem of identity bound to diet and the belief that is inherent in people's perception and ideas around diet and health i mean as a doctor who cares i i um i hope not personally i kind of hope so because yeah, I that's think you that's would... the lawyer in you yeah <laughs> probably <laughs> but it, you know at least everyone would sit up then and be like shit we've gone too far oh no so but look, all right. It, so, by the way, I'm not wishing death. On <laughs> yeah, let's clarify. Um, but but let's just. So, I think we we do need to try and bring this episode to a close, um, right. In some way, shape, or form, because I mean, it's you know, they're interesting conversations, but we could literally just mm -hmm. get annoyed about stuff for a long time. Yeah. Um, but let's try and end this in a practical, brief-ish way, if we can. Yes. So, yes, these conversations are hard. Um, Let's just briefly touch on a few of the fallacies we haven't touched on already. Right. Um, in regards to um, how they play out nutritionally. Yeah. And yeah. the way that I think of this yeah. in, in in my head is because, again, I am a healthcare professional. When I see patients that come in and they have a particular fallacy that is influencing their mm. thinking, they don't come in and say, by the way, doc. I have authority bias. <laughs> yeah. like it, and, and I saw this doctor who said this. They, they just come in and they say, well, I saw this doctor and they said this. Right. And so I think knowing some of these fallacies yeah. specifically is yeah. helpful to be able to then challenge yeah, to, it in, to, a, in, exactly. a, in a compassionate way. As Goldacre way. said, to disabuse them yeah. of that thinking. Exactly. So yes. we talked about um, appeal to ignorance. Mm -hmm. We talked about the fact that um, the argument that science doesn't know everything, therefore this must be. The, yeah. the, this is yeah. probably this yeah. is this probably because, true. <laughs> yeah, this is just because science hasn't got there yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that or one, or using it to dismiss, you know, an, an absolutely established accumulated body of knowledge. Like, for example, eating vegetables and fruit is just good for you. Yeah, incontrovertible yeah. fact of exactly. nutrition at this point. But it's disregarded when so, when well we have no <laughs> long term data showing a carnivore diet isn't good for you. It's like that's appeal to pure ignorance. <laughs> 
So there's one. There's one. <laughs> Appeal to authority we just mentioned a second ago. So yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah, don't listen to someone because they have just a certain title that you think means they know what they're talking about. Scrutinize what they're saying mm. and the content that comes out their mouth. And that applies to dietitians, nutritionists, doctors, anyone that nominally is a public facing healthcare professional. Mm. Don't just be like, they must know what they're talking about, right? Obviously, so, this comes question. with it with it nuance. So obviously, there are there is a reason why we should be perhaps paying a little more attention to people who at least yeah. have have spent dedicated time studying. Well, so in here's, a field here's that the extra layer about. onto that that I say to people that because people say, well, how do I know? Yeah, um, you do not have to be if you come away with anything from this episode, you do not have to be an expert to ask questions. And I feel like people think that they have to have some sort of amount of knowledge to actually challenge people. You don't. The burden of proof is on them. So if you see some silly post about basil curing whatever or having inflammation, roles, inflammation you're allowed to ask, where is your evidence to support that claim? And they can't throw it back on you. That's the burden of proof is on them. So if they come back to you and say, well, do you have any evidence? It's not true. Some people shy away then. Don't actually shy down from that at that point. Reiterate, I'm sorry, you have made the claim. It's up to you to provide the supporting evidence. So that's mm. a really important thing. You don't have to be an expert to ask questions. Yeah. And I really encourage you, ask those questions. Even if you're a healthcare professional and a colleague saying, well, didn't you know uh, high cholesterol isn't a risk factor for heart disease. Okay, show me your evidence that supports that. And it's up to them to prove it. So I always say how you know if someone is a healthcare professional and they're talking about nutrition, research, or science purportedly, they should be able to show you what studies show what they're saying they show and how those studies show them. And any good professional worth their salt will be able to say, well, this study shows X, and it shows it because if you look here, what they did was ABC. Yeah. And not, that not is, just here's a study, here is the study. look into it yourself. Yeah. It or a link to the abstract. Exactly. Yeah. Um, which is what they tend to do. So any good practitioner will take the patience and time to say, this study showed it and it showed it because A, B and C and that led to D. And that's how you know. So it's up to you to ask the questions, but I want you to feel empowered to do that. Hmm. Stay in, I mean, think it brings up an interesting topic when people say stay in your lane. It's like stay in your lane when you're giving out information. Mm -hmm. Don't stay in your lane when you're asking questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh, excuse me, Veer, excuse if you're, me, why are you part of this conversation? You should stay yeah. in your lane. If well, I am. Yeah. <laughs> if you're a consumer of information, like that is your, lane. your lane is the whole highway. <laughs> Veer all over that shit and, and cause trouble and ask questions, <laughs> you know? What stay in your lane, stay in your lane has been a bit confused lately in the conversations and people think, oh, well, it means that, well, any doctor shouldn't talk about nutrition. Absolutely mm. not that. That is not what it means. What stay in your lane well, I'm glad means not, I'm part of this is podcast. if you are speaking to something, you have to have done your research and know what you are speaking to. You have to have the capacity to speak to what you are speaking to. So, and... and be willing to be wrong with that and be willing to be wrong 100 oh nice yeah that's yeah. very true because again anyone can do their 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 backyard google research right and come and say but i've researched the topic yeah yeah, yeah. well but, of course but, but that's if, again coming back to if they're good they'll say exactly these studies show it and this is how they show and it. if someone comes on and goes but what about these these studies that actually show this the opposite way then they should be willing to go, oh okay well i hadn't seen those or yes i've seen those and this is why i don't think that they're relevant exactly but at this, at the problem with these things is that people, some people do that and they just go, oh, I don't think they're relevant because they weren't long enough or they yeah. weren't, they're well, not relevant that's because that's how we know they're engaging in anti-science thinking. Yeah. You know, if someone says, well, I just don't agree with those studies because uh, they weren't this or they, there's that outright dismissal. It's like, I'm sorry, you haven't gone to any lengths to tell me what your dismissal is. So I'm assuming it's a summary dismissal, which is not acceptable. Yeah. <laughs> right. Next fallacy. Mm -hmm. Single cause fallacy. Yeah big one that plays out with diet because we don't like to wrestle with the complexity of what has happened in our food environment over the last 50 years and the factors that have influenced it even ones people don't even think about like 
the international trade agreements that were increasingly um, becoming more global uh, networks and food companies and also nations were integrated both vertically and horizontally mm. post Second World War. So all of these really like complex geopolitical factors underscoring a shift in our food supply, the socioeconomic stuff we'll talk about. Mm. So it's far easier to sit back and go, sugar. Yeah, definitely right? sugar. Um, but it's only sugar now because we were wrong about fat. Right, 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 of course. And so, look, the reality is when we come to talk about diet, no nutrient exists in isolation. Diet's always the sum of its parts. The substitution effects in diet are very important, something mm. we appreciate more now. If you yeah, lower yeah. something, you have to swap it with something else. Yeah. Um, You're going to eat the same, usually, but the also, same amount yeah, of energy. When you it's look just, at what um, is it? the characteristics of the typical Western diet, one of the interesting things is at a, at a macronutrient level and in certain characteristics like sodium intake, you know, we take someone from Detroit, compare them to someone in London, compare them to someone in, in, in Brisbane, actually the composition is going to be relatively the same because we've created a homogenous global industrialized diet. Yeah. So roughly the sugar content of, of a diet in the UK is the same as the States. Fat content, roughly the same in terms of percentage energy and then percentage from saturated fat, roughly the same. So it's a fairly homogenous diet, but it's defined by high total energy, high energy density, foods that are concomitantly high in fat, sugar or starch, salt and all of these. So the diet health interface is complex. Our food supply, albeit homogenous, is still complex in terms of what's putting it together and getting it into people's mouths. Trying to identify a single causative agent in that is an absolute fallacy of thought. Mm. It's not helping. It's not. Um, what was the other one that we had? Uh, exception fallacy. That's oh, yeah. a good one. Yeah, this is. <laughs> I, I think this is quite important for people, particularly where like it comes to like minor kind of scaremongering. So an exception yeah. fallacy. So is we can where, bring gluten into this one, right? Yeah. Where, where you make inferences about a group based on a few accepted individuals. So where we assume, for example, we know that about 1% of the population has celiac disease. Mm. We do know that a non-celiac wheat sensitivity phenotype does appear to mm. exist, mm. Um, objectively. Symptomatically, at least. We also do know that, no, there was, an, there was a really nice study in 2015 that showed the same uh, serological markers of... Uh, two proteins that are involved um, in microbial translocation okay. and uh, biopsy intestinal. Wise. Hmm? Biopsy wise, were uh, I am going to have to go back to the study. It was Ude et al. Oh. Um, nice study in people self-reporting as 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 having yeah, yeah. gluten issues. But well, we can talk about that one specifically when we get to our gluten yeah. talk. That's cool. And so there, there, there does seem to be this estimate that there is. And then there's also though, even if even if that's still emerging, what we do know is there's an overlap with irritable bowel syndrome and mm -hmm. FODMAP sensitivity mm -hmm. and gluten. So a couple of nice papers by, I think it was Bessierski, I can't remember, it was a kind of Slavic sounding second name. Anyway, they did a couple of nice controlled studies where they actually left gluten in the diet, but, t but lowered FODMAPs in people self-reporting as gluten intolerant with IBS symptoms. And actually their symptoms self-reported symptoms improved. So this so it implicated FODMAPs, these short-chain carbohydrates, more than gluten. So mm. there is this overlap with gluten and IBS. And the thing is, gluten and FODMAPs often travel together in, in common mm. foods. Yeah. So Again, we can't separate them. Exactly. Single cause and all that. But again, we're talking about small additional percentages of the total population. And yeah. the point here is it does not mean you, right? So when we assume that because a small subset of the population has these issues, then gluten is the devil in everybody, mm. that's a problem. Yeah. When we extrapolate that some people do have aller adult allergenicity to cow's milk proteins and lactose intolerance is well established, and we assume, oh my God, no one can tolerate dairy anymore, you know, because whatever. Mm. And it doesn't mean you. And I think an important thing to note is that the nocebo effect with diet is just as real oh, yeah. as these issues. Absolutely. So if you go around continually telling yourself that you're intolerant to gluten and dairy, what do you think is going to happen when you have the bite yeah. of a sandwich? It makes things so complicated. Right. <laughs> so don't assume that because there are accepted individuals in small subsets of the population that what they are experiencing applies to you. Yeah. I think our last one was probably appeals to nature. 
Yeah, that's become we. I mean, it's there the, are so it's many the scare, it's yeah, the fear of chemicals. Yeah, right? the appeal to nature fallacy. You know, natural is good because unnatural is double plus ungood. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like that double plus ungood. Yeah, let's go Orwellian with this. Yeah, you can't say um, the word bad. It's yeah, it's double plus ungood. Um, so, and we see this. There's you know, there's a couple of examples because it is common. You know, in nutrition in the last while, we've had this real obsession with you know natural. If it's natural, it's good for you. So, you know, don't put sugar in your brownies. Put date syrup, and it's like <laughs> mm, okay. agave. Agave. I think for me, there's two pretty hilarious examples of this. One is artificial sweeteners and just the complete hysteria that we get over that because it's got the word artificial in it. Interestingly, you know, you can use the term non-nutritive sweetener, which seems a little less polarizing. But the idea that these compounds are suddenly unleashed in the food supply and are inherently bad for you because they're artificial Um, And so that's an example of the appeal to nature fallacy. The other thing that I think has been very common post a couple of Netflix documentaries (laughs) is this idea about dairy. You know, we're the only species that drinks another's milk. You know, that's not natural. It's like, well, that's return to cannibalism because that logic implies we should only consume other humans. I mean, we're pretty much the only species that cooks our food. doesn't mean we should right. eat anything raw. Yeah. Although some people would argue we should. There was a, there was a very <laughs> funny tweet that went around about we're also the only species that drinks Mai Tais or something like that. You know, <laughs> leave, leave me have my glass of milk, Sharon. Um, you know, a, a characteristic feature of human diets is adaptability and diversity. We yeah. are obligate omnivores, which yeah. is why we managed to settle every corner of the globe and not just certain ecological niches. And we're not talking, again, we're not talking ethics here if you don't want to. We're not. If, products, yeah, if, you don't, if you don't want to consume dairy for ethical reasons, don't do but it. But don't tell everyone else that they can't do it because it's unhealthy for yeah. them. Or unnatural. And that, and that the, the reasoning for it being unhealthy is that it's unnatural it's yeah. like that is a fallacy as well <sighs> so I, I think uh, so that, those are probably the main ones that tend to come up but the issue and again the reason why we're not going to put the world to rights through one podcast which we thought was going to be short but i think is almost an hour um <laughs> well we've got a lot to delete from the start <laughs> no i don't think we do what I are you talking about to. um is because these don't tend to come in isolation right they tend no. to they tend to be interwoven from one to the other so you know you've got you've got the talk of gluten you've got the the talk of uh, of the fact that it's not natural because we've been you know genetically modifying our wheat and therefore that's why gluten is bad <laughs> right, and there yeah. are some people who have this leaky gut from gluten and therefore everyone and must, have, everyone leaky must gut. have leaky gut and and therefore you know that is the only thing that is causing the world's problems it's gluten and so all of these fallacies right. tend to come Coalesce. together yes they do. So it's important to be able to pick them apart a little mm-hmm. bit. When somebody gives you this full sentence of all of this and you go, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Let's, yeah. And yeah, I know there isn't always the time to pick all this stuff apart, specifically speaking to people within a clinic setting or a mm-hmm. hospital setting, or whatever. But, but you know, you we, try, we still try need to, di- we need yeah. to be disabusing that's not people a good, of that's not these a good, ideas. Yeah, that's not a good excuse to not try. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a good excuse to not have the ability to mm-hmm. if you are in a setting where you can. Mm-hmm. And and a lot of this stuff won't necessarily, in a weird way, the stuff that I found, uh, the, the most impact that I end up having around some of these topics isn't necessarily in the hospital. Mm. And again, I'm not a GP, so I'm not having patients come in talking to me specifically about this particular issue. But they tend to be, you know, within family, friends, colleagues, ten, you know, you're going to be able to have the time to have these conversations. If we all just had these conversations, we'd end up reaching the patients that we end up seeing in the right. end anyway. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. yes, we need to be able to be addressing certain things with certain patients when they come in. But if we just have these conversations more frequently in the first place, mm-hmm. it's going to start doing some good. We yeah. can't just wait for the opportune moment. We need to just always be having these oh, conversations. Oh, yeah, just constantly. Be Somebody about says it. something yeah. that uh, <laughs> that they, you know, that that they've they've gone keto and it's been great for them. Your your instinct might be just be like, okay, I'm just not gonna, I'm not gonna bother. Like, I'm just mm. gonna move on. And fine, you can do what you want. But at the same time, there are gonna be people around listening to this person right. talk about how keto is amazing. And if you just go, if you just ask some ask some questions, yeah. just be like, well, why, why, like, why have you mm. lost weight on it? What's the reason? Do you think it's this mm. why is why are carbs bad are mm. they bad is mm. that true mm. like just give people that 
alternative questioning, that alternative that you know, that line of thought. Get that, a response. Exactly. Just start, just let's let's keep having these conversations. Yeah, I think so. And hopefully there's been so obviously we could just sit here for days going through different fallacies, but you know, <laughs> I, got I think, far too I think there's two topical things to, to take away. One is, you know, understanding that the identity issues in nutrition are are a massive problem. And if you do find that maybe this has touched a chord, maybe examine that. Maybe examine the fact that if you got your back up listening to this, is it because you're a little entrenched with your thinking about diet and nutrition and where where you should be agnostic? Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe that's a challenge to murder your darlings and seek out evidence that disconfirms yeah. your beliefs. And I know that's difficult to do. Yeah. But if we're talking to healthcare professionals here, it is incumbent on you to do it. Yeah. You're allowed to have a preference. You're allowed. But if your preference becomes your identity. To change your mind and update your thinking. Yeah. But again, if your preference though, if your preference becomes your identity, then that then influences every interaction you have with everybody else. And that's not being, that's not ethical as somebody who Mm -hmm. has promised to be unbiased with their treatment. Right. Yeah. If you want to be biased with the treatment, that's fine, but you're listening to a podcast. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. Right. Cool. Uh, yeah. We will see you in the next one. We'll, we're going to annoy some more people by talking about poverty. Mm. Yeah. Social determinants of health. Exactly. Mm. See you later. See you later.